Okay, everyone. <laughs> Have a good lunch. Yeah? Are you happy or sleepy? Or both? <laughs> a bit of both. Okay. So we're going to, I'll just uh, do a little bit more Dhamma sharing yeah, with you before we uh, do some more meditation. Usually, after, straight after lunch, good to listen to some Dhamma. At least you don't, you know, it's a bit more not as sleep inducing as meditation can be sometimes. So it's a, it's a good opportunity here. Yeah. So, uh, again, the theme of this uh, little retreat uh, arranged by Venerable Chanda is the idea of uh, sila as a foundation for the uh, entire Buddhist path. Uh, in fact, it is a bit more complicated than that. Yeah? And if, if you read the suttas carefully, you find that it's not just sila, but there's a number of things uh, that are at the foundation of the Buddhist path. Uh, so you could say that uh, good spiritual friendship uh, is that the foundation of the path? Yeah, that's one way of looking at it. You could say that uh, apamada, which is like diligence or heedfulness, uh, is at the foundation of the Buddhist path. You could say that uh, yonisomanasikara, yeah, wise reflection, is at the foundation of the Buddhist path. So many things are at the foundation. But there's a particular reason why sila is singled out, the idea of morality. And the reason is that um, these uh, thing, a thing like sila, is one of the what is called the six anusatis. Anusatis are the six recollections, uh, and these are ways of contemplating the dhamma, if you like, uh, that can result in joy, happiness, and all these positive states of mind. Uh, and then the med- process of meditation and emerges from that joy, from that happiness that you have. Uh, and so you can see here how the sila and the meditation they kind of uh, join forces. You see the sila playing a role in meditation practice. And of course, when you see that, you become much more interested in sila. Yeah, you want to purify it further because you understand the power it has to lead your mind to these, uh, you know, marvelous qualities and states that we uh, hopefully one day we will sort of uh, achieve or it it will happen to us or whatever the right word is. Always dangerous to say achieve, right? Say achieve, it sounds like you're going to get in there, I'm going to do this. uh, and then the ego gets involved. Yeah, the ego is always going to do things. Uh, but ego is just a nuisance. It's just a problem. Uh, so let's forget about the ego. So it's just these things happen to us. Uh, and that's a very nice way of thinking about meditation. Yeah, you sit back uh, and you allow everything to happen to you rather than you doing it. Uh, and then what happens when you think like that is that you leave the self, you leave the ego out of the equation because you think like that. Uh, but what you do have to do, uh, what is definitely required then, uh, is to put the foundations into place, uh, Yeah, the sila, etc. So these six uh, anusatis, these six reflections that provide a foundation for meditation is the contemplation of the Buddha. Uh, yeah, I talked very briefly about that this morning. I uh, can go into much more detail about the contemplation of the Buddha. It's actually very inspiring, very interesting, uh, but uh, we'll leave it out for now because it takes too much time. Um, then you have the contemplation of the Dhamma, yeah, which is the teaching of the Buddha. Everything starts with the Buddha. The Buddha is the, is the root cause <coughs> of Buddhism. And once the Buddha arises in the world, then the Dhamma is the expression, the teaching of that Buddha. And so contemplation of Dhamma is a very interesting thing to do. Yeah? Contemplate what these teachings really are about as a source of joy. Have you ever tried that? Contemplating, it's the thing, the thing, Dhamma, 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 wow, Dhamma. <laughs> yeah, you get really inspired, you get high on the idea of Dhamma, that's kind of the idea here. And so how can you do that? And one of the, uh, it's very, very, I'm not going to talk much about this, but it's very, very briefly, because uh, it's interesting to know some approaches to these things, yeah? It's not obvious how we do that. Uh, and so the way, one of the ways that I like to think about the Dhamma is what I said just before. This is the most, did I say it before? I think I did. I can't remember what I said before. <laughs> anyway, this is the most important, uh, maybe I said yes, the literature uh, in the history of humanity. Uh, yeah, that's what the Dhamma is. Nothing is more important than this. Uh, and I was recently, I, I was recently in Sydney, not recently, a few months ago, I was in Sydney to visit my my, my good friend Venerable Sud- Bhante Sujato, who is also very much into, you know, the early Buddhist texts and these kind of things. And we, we, had, we did a book launch together. Uh, so we were launching these books, these translations of the suttas and the Vinaya Pitaka. And we were in this very nice building, yeah, kind of one of these uh, stately uh, buildings by Australian standards, uh, yeah, kind of colonial style buildings, grand, tall ceilings, very, very beautiful building. It's the State Library of New South Wales, yeah, one of the largest states in Australia. 
And so we were there and we had this launch of the scriptures and we had invited some very kind of my, in Australia, very prominent people. One of them was the premier, ex-premier of Western Australia. He's like the prime minister of Western Australia, basically. And he's kind of leaning Buddhist, yeah? So he, come, he comes to these things. Uh, is that nice? Uh, yeah, you get kind of top uh, people who are really kind of people at the top of the political scene anyway, coming to these events. That was really, really nice. Uh, and so we launched these books. And uh, when, I, when we were there, because I was one of the translators, I had to say something. Uh, so I said, this is the most important event in Australian history. Yeah. <laughs> People were looking at me. <laughs> that was good fun to say. Yeah. Just to say, just to say that, I really kind of, because it, it grabs people's attention, right? In a, in a, in a, um, a company like that, it's easy to say those things because they're all Buddhists. Uh, yeah? So they understand what you're saying. If you said it to an Aust ordinary Australian, they might think you're putting down Australia or something. Yeah? But uh, that's missing the point. Uh, it's got nothing to do with putting down Australia. It's an understanding of the significance of the Dhamma. That is what it really is about. Uh, and here we are for the first time publishing these suttas uh, in Australia, on Australian soil, making the Dhamma available to the Australian people, wherever they might be. And that's just a, such a momentous thing. Yeah, it would be even more momentous if it wasn't available already, of course. <laughs> but still, the fact that it's published there and now it's made available, it's kind of there's something about that is very powerful. Of course, I was wrong. I shouldn't have said it, it wasn't the most important event in Australian history, it was the most, these are the most important books ever published in humanity. Uh, that would have been more, I think, more uh, correct. Uh, why is that the case? Uh, why are these books so important? Uh, what is it about the teaching of the Buddha that actually stands out in the history of world literature? Uh, and uh, what makes them stand out, of course, is that they are wisdom. They are wisdom distilled down. There's kind of no, very, very little uh, extra material, extraneous material that isn't required. Everything is just pure wisdom in a sense. Uh, there's a little bit of extra, there's a kind of how are you, I'm well, that kind of thing of course. But that's kind of also a bit of wisdom in that as well, surprisingly. Uh, but basically it's distilled wisdom. Uh, yeah, when we talk about great literature, we talk about people who are good observers of humanity, who are able to draw, kind of draw some wisdom from observing humanity, you know, not like Shakespeare or whatever, yeah. But still, Shakespeare is like, uh, that's not that big part of Shakespeare, is that entertainment, right? Uh, that's kind of a big part of it. That's why people see plays and things. Uh, but this is like distilled wisdom. Yeah, it's like, like the best of Shakespeare multiplied by a thousand or a million. Actually, we can't really multiply it because there's a different league. Yeah. And so this, this, is, uh, this is why this is so important. Uh, so what does it mean to have wisdom distilled down to the most kind of, uh, to the most um, bare bones, just pure wisdom? What does it actually mean? Uh, and what it means, and this is like the gift of the Buddha to the world. Uh, it means that the Buddha gives us uh, a vision of the world uh, as the world is uh, on a plate and says, this is what I have seen. I have understood reality. I know you don't understand it because you're all deluded, you're all suffering. I've gone beyond this. I've seen the way things actually are. So what the Buddha gives us uh, is a right view. He gives us a knowledge and understanding of the way the world actually is, so we can act upon that understanding. And if you don't see the world as it actually is, you're going to make really bad choices. Obviously, because our choices are based on how we understand things. And if you have wrong view, you're going to make bad choices. It's like if you wanted to come to the Quaker's house this morning, but you thought it was south of Oxford, Dukkha, you can't make it. Yeah, so you have lots of dukkha. You can, yeah, it's terrible not to be part of this, isn't it? I, I, I'd say this is really worthwhile coming, especially if you want to be part of it. It's bad not to be part of it. And so, whenever we have wrong view, yeah, Quaker's house south of Oxford, wrong view. Yeah, Quaker's house actually in the slightly north of Oxford. Is that right? Yeah, no, yeah, so slightly north of Oxford instead. Yeah, so that's kind of right view then. But of course, that's kind of irrelevant. It's the big view, understanding of life that really matters. And here the Buddha comes, tells us in two, in how many pages? 10,000 pages or whatever, 10,000 pages of just right view, 
This is the way the world is. Yeah, there is no essence in a human being. That is the core insight of the Buddha, the lack of any essence. And these are the consequences of that. This is what you have to do to get and understand, have the same insight for yourself. He gives it us on a plate. Now we can start to make good decisions because we are given that same right view that the Buddha had. Now we can start to live our lives in accordance with that right view. So this is the highest gift anyone can give you. This is the greatest jewel. Why? Because right view gives you access to happiness, avoidance of suffering, to all the good things in life. The meaning of life itself arises out of the idea of right view. Isn't that kind of extraordinary? You know, you are thankful for somebody, like Darren just gave me a little sweet. That was very nice, Darren. Thank you very much for that little sweet. And you feel happy just giving a little sweet, right? Yeah, I feel happy. Hope you maybe feel happy as well. But here, the suttas are a few levels up from sweet. <laughs> yeah? So we should, if we really understand what we are given, yeah, it's something very, very profound and powerful. This is why the Buddha is a teacher among teachers. We may be grateful to an ordinary teacher, but this is teacher on an entirely different level again. So when you read the suttas, when you take these books in your hand, or maybe you read them on the internet, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what you do, uh, yeah, you should kind of shake a little bit. Whoa, the suit is... Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's when you have really understood what's going on. Whoa, what is he going to say now? Whoa, this is exciting. Yeah. And then you read very, very carefully, because you know every word matters. Uh, every syllable has something to tell you. Every little thing that may seem insignificant actually probably has some kind of significance. Uh, yeah, that's kind of the right attitude to the suttas. Uh, and then, uh, when you have that kind of attitude, uh, understanding that the Buddha is actually there to teach you, uh, because that's what he actually did uh, when he taught two and a half thousand years ago, uh, he knew that he was setting in motion the wheel of the Dhamma. He knew this would carry on into the future, going from India to the various parts of the world, first to Sri Lanka, yeah, that was one of the first places, then to the north of India, then on the Silk Road into China, and then kind of more and more parts of, uh, of Asia, and eventually spreading all the way to Oxford. Uh. <laughs> it's good, isn't it? Uh, it's here in Oxford now. Uh, and that is in large part due to Venerable Chanda, and also some of the other monks, actually, like your monastery, uh, oh, I can't remember the name, but Venerable Damasami. Is he the one who started the monastery? Uh, yes. Okay, so there you are. So, uh, this is uh, this remarkable thing uh, that we are in the presence of when you read the suttas. Uh, the Buddha set in motion the will of the Dhamma. He knew that he was talking to people, not just the audience in front of him, uh, but audiences in the future, uh, audiences in countries far away with a different culture, different background. Uh, so he couched his language uh, in, a, in, in, in a way that is ordinary. Yeah? He speaks in a way that is not trapped by the Indian cultural norms, but more like universal aspects of human psychology. You read the sutta, you recognize it straight away. It doesn't matter if you're English or even Norwegians can understand this. Yeah? <laughs> and so everyone, and so it's kind of, it's, it has this universal aspect to it, which is also very, very unique in the history of the world in terms of spirituality or cultures or religion or whatever this kind of universal thing, because it was universal from the beginning. He wasn't teaching anything from the point of view of a culture, but from the point of view of an insight into the nature of what it is to be a human being. So this is the how you can contemplate the Dhamma. And you think, wow, this is what I've been given by the Buddha. This amazing treasure. And then you kind of get into it. But what I really want to talk about, because after the Dhamma, then comes the contemplation of the Sangha, yeah, and that of, because the Sangha emerges from the Dhamma, and the reason why is because when the Dhamma is available in the world, people practicing accordingly, they become Sanghas, they ordain and they have these deep insights. Uh, this is the noble Sangha we're talking about here. Uh, and then from that, the triple gem, come, is the path, is the next one. Uh, and the uh, most important aspect of that path in this context uh, is the idea of sila. So sila nusati, the recollection of virtue, uh, is uh, um, one, the next thing that comes here. Uh, so recalling basically your own virtue. Uh, yeah, feeling good about the fact that you are 
living well, yeah, having a sense of goodness inside, having a kind of a warm feeling about how you live your life, uh, yeah, a sense that you are, sense of self-worth, self-valuing and these kind of things, they emerge out of that sila, out of living a kind and a good life. Uh, and then you can use that uh, as a contemplation. Uh. So let me just read out what the Buddha has to say about this, uh, because I will keep on saying the Buddha says this, the Buddha says that, uh, but maybe I'm just lying to you, so now I'm going to read it so that you, are, you can be absolutely sure I'm not lying. Do you think I'm lying to you, or do you think I'm not? Okay, good. I'm glad. I want to... <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so let's see. <laughs> so this is what the Buddha has to say about this, right? So this is the idea of uh, uh, recalling your virtue. Huh? Uh, so, furthermore, this is number four, that's why it says furthermore. Furthermore, a noble disciple, uh, or indeed anyone, uh, recollects their own ethical conduct. This is the sila, which is, and this is the important point, which is unbroken, uh, impeccable, spotless, uh, unmarred, liberating, praised by sensible people, uh, not mistaken, I disagree with that translation, but anyway, not mistaken, and leading to immersion. Yes, yeah, so you get no, I don't know if, if those of you who are familiar with Bhante Sujato get no points for guessing that's his translation. <laughs> <laughs> when a noble disciple recollects their own ethical conduct, their mind is not full of greed, hatred, and delusion. Uh, and delusion. Uh, at that time, their mind is unswerving, or their mind is straight, uh, based on the on ethics or ethical conduct. Uh, the noble disciple whose mind is straight or unswerving finds inspiration in the meaning and the teaching, uh, and finds joy connected with the teaching. Uh, when a joyful rapture springs up, when the mind is full of rapture, the body becomes tranquil. When the body is tranquil, you feel bliss. And when you're blissful, the mind becomes immersed in samadhi, or stilled if you like. This is called the noble disciple who lives in balance among people who are unbalanced, who lives untroubled among people who are troubled. They've entered the stream of the teaching and developed the recollection of virtue. So um, this is the idea here, yeah? So you can see how samadhi, it says there, specifically says stillness, which um, Bhante Suddhartha translates as immersion, is the outcome of this kind of recollection here. I'm losing my, losing my space. Okay, here we are. So uh, this is what this is about. And you can see here, all of, many of these, um, the way that the sila is uh, qualified here, unbroken, impeccable, spotless, unmarred, means that the better your conduct is, uh, the more powerful this is going to be, uh, right? Uh, so you, the more able you are to live a life of morality in a very deep sense, uh, and I mentioned before this morning that really deep morality is to have a mind that is, you know, has compassion, has a sense of love, has a sense of friendliness, uh, has all of these kind of qualities. That is the really most profound aspect of morality. Uh, and so we should really try to take it to that uh, point, yeah, when we kind of feel a sense of friendliness to everyone in the world. Uh, if, even if people in the world don't like you, it doesn't matter. You kind of open up your heart to everyone in the world. Uh, and if you can do that, uh, then you are really practicing this very fully. If you do some metta meditation, you feel really, you know, you have this kind of broad sense of friendliness for the whole world, uh, it's, and you walk down the street, you kind of smile to everyone, right? And if they don't smile to you, actually, it doesn't matter. Who cares? That's, that's, not, that's their problem, you know? And you smile to the whole world. And you have this natural tendency to be kind to people around you when you have these things established in your heart. So this is what we want to, to try, yeah? When we live our lives, uh, purify the virtuous conduct. So a bit of doing metta, understanding people in the right way, understanding why they are worthy of compassion and and uh, friendliness uh, is a very important part of this path. Uh. I remember one night I was walking in the monastery at Bodhinana Monastery uh, and I was kind of looking up into the sky and I was saying that the, the night sky is very quite spectacular in, in Australia because you have the Milky Way. Yeah, You don't have this in the Northern Hemisphere, but in, in the Southern Hemisphere you have. So you've seen lots and lots of stars. Uh, the Southern Cross, if you see the Australian flag, it has the kind of the Southern Cross in it that comes from that. Uh. And so uh, I'm looking up in the sky and I was thinking how sometimes people, 
They look up into the sky and when they see the night sky, see the universe, they have this feeling that the universe is kind of cold. Yeah, it's barren. It's just stars and matter out there. We are the only human beings on this planet. This enormous cold universe around us. But actually, it occurred to me, that is not the Buddhist view of the universe. The Buddhist view of the universe is that the universe and the galaxies are ruled by these Brahmas. Yeah, you have the thousandfold world system Brahma, the, the thousandfold to the second power Brahma, right? And so these world systems are kind of permeated by these divine beings who have purified their heart to the very, very highest level. The re way to get reborn as a Brahma is to attain one of these very powerful states of Samadhi called the Dhanas, abandoning all your defilements, practicing the four Brahma Viharas, the divine abidings. That's how you become a Brahma. Yeah, these are these gods. And, so, and then from that, because of power, they become this spirit yeah, or this being that kind of pervades almost the entire universe, certainly like the galaxy. And so when you look up into the sky, what you are seeing yeah, in, in a certain way is that almost like a manifestation of that Brahma, because this is the sphere that this Brahma pervades. So next time you look up into the night sky, what you're seeing is not coldness. You're not seeing matter that is kind of without any feelings or anything. What you're seeing is the realm of Brahma. You're seeing the realm of loving kindness or compassion or sympathetic joy and equanimity. You're seeing the realm of deep samadhi. That's what you're seeing when you look out into the universe. And I promise you, if you look at the universe like that, it will never look to you in exactly the same way again. Now it will be transformed into something very, very beautiful and powerful. It's like you can feel the love almost of the universe when you look at it like that. And then this is one way of transforming one's perceptions. And I remember doing that one night. I was just looking out and suddenly it occurred to me that we're looking at the universe in the wrong way. This is a much better way of looking at the universe. And then you feel connected in a very large way. Yeah, in this enormous way you feel connected with the universe. If the universe is benevolent, if the universe is kind, it doesn't matter if there are a few problems in your daily life. These are just little things yeah, in this daily life. But in, for the large part, the universe actually is a positive force, something positive in your life. Anyway, sometimes you kind of, you, you know, your, your perspective shifts a little bit. Uh, and this is a beautiful way of then moving on to this idea of purifying your seela in a deeper way, uh, where you start to feel this uh, expansive sense of friendliness for everything around you. Huh? These are just suggestions, you know, what I'm saying you know, may not make any sense to you. That's okay. It doesn't have to make any sense. Uh, they're just kind of ideas. Uh, and if you like the ideas, uh, great. If you don't like them, Good enough as well, doesn't really matter here. Either way is fine. Here. So this is a way of thinking about this. Another thing I should bring up, I mentioned yesterday, because I think it's really, really important in our ability to purify our conduct. Yeah, and I was saying yesterday during the talk that someone asked about how you can, you know, uh, what was the question again? Uh -huh. Whatever, I, I can't remember exactly the question. But I, my reply was about how we can purify our virtue. Huh? Yeah, because this is actually quite hard. And uh, what you very, very often will hear in Buddhist circles is that you have to be mindful. Huh? And if you're mindful, you can make good choices. Yeah, you can do the right thing. Huh? But in my experience, uh, sometimes people are mindful, they still make bad choices. Uh, yeah? I was mindful, but I mindfully made a bad choice. <laughs> Right? This is what people do. I know people who kind of have exactly these feelings. Yeah, I, I, I was mindful, but I decided I go to tell that person off. Yeah, okay. All right, okay, whatever. So that means mindfulness doesn't always work, right? It doesn't always have the power that you think it has. And not just that, but very often we are not all that mindful in daily life. I'm sure all of you know, everyone these days seems to be way too busy. Yeah? So maybe, maybe this, I often wonder whether the kind of modernity is good or bad for people. But anyway... Um, so, very often we don't have the mindfulness. Uh, secondly, even if we have mindfulness, we still make bad decisions. Uh, so, what then is the way to become more virtuous uh, if mindfulness doesn't work? Uh, and the answer is right view. Yeah, because right view is at the foundation of the Buddhist path. In fact, right view comes before morality, whereas mindfulness comes after morality on the Buddhist path anyway. So, according to the Noble Eightfold Path, 
mindfulness is not really supportive of virtue. Of course it is, but it has to be, first of all, developed through virtue. Uh, so we cannot really, it's kind of putting cart before the horse a little bit, uh, yeah? So first of all, right view, that will help you develop the virtue, which then in turn will help you to be mindful. And then that mindfulness will then, of course, reinforce the virtue at the beginning. But that's a later stage. That's not the beginning of the path. Uh. And so right view uh, is a thing to do, yeah? Uh, for, to actually be able to practice these things fully. Uh. And so how do we do this? Uh? And this is, for those of you who were there yesterday, this will, you will hear it again, so I, I don't even apologize anymore for telling things again. But <laughs> and uh, so the idea here is this is kind of a simile that came to my mind at some point. I'm not sure exactly where it came from. Maybe I've heard it somewhere else. But this is uh, the simile of like, if you are going into the busy street in Oxford, I was just out on the high street or whatever street it's called over here myself. And uh, when I came to the street, uh, did I just walk straight into the street, or did I look left and right, first of all? I was smart enough to look left and right. Yeah, I looked left and right, first of all. Why did I look left and right? Was it because I was incredibly mindful? Actually, no, I didn't really need to be very mindful, because I knew it's dangerous to walk into the street. And you will notice that people who have even zero mindfulness, People who are kind of uh, talking on the mobile phone, yeah, and kind of videoing at the same time or doing whatever, yeah, and just kind of completely out of it. Uh, they don't see any people, and no they don't even notice the people around them. But when they come to the street, uh, they still stop and they still look left and right first. Uh, in other words, you don't need much mindfulness. Uh, why? Because you have right view. The right view that this is dangerous. That is the right view when it comes to streets. And because that right view is so powerful, you always look left and right, even if you have exactly zero mindfulness. No, not exactly zero. That's an exaggeration. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> So, of course, you have some mindfulness, but the mindfulness arises from the right view. Yeah, that's the point. So uh, I'm, I'm brought up in this Ajahn Brahm school of uh, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Yeah. <laughs> That's the Ajahn Brahm school of, of, I'm not sure if it's Dhamma or what it is, but anyway, it's... Uh, it's <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so what that means is understanding the danger of immorality. Yeah. And if you understand the danger in immorality, yeah, it is much more dangerous to do something immoral than to walk into that street. Yeah. This is what we don't get. Yeah, we think that walking into the street is dangerous, but yeah, being immoral, a little lie here and there, yeah, you know, that's part of the course, isn't it? Uh, everyone, you have to lie sometimes, otherwise, kind of life gets too difficult uh, or, or whatever. Uh, so we are not so concerned about the idea of morality sometimes, but actually, immorality, uh, not taking the opportunity to do the right thing when we can, that is far more dangerous than walking into that street. Uh, why? Because you are creating a bad future for yourself when you do that. If you die in an accident, your future is whatever karma you have done. It's got nothing to do with the accident. You may still go to a good future. But if you do immoral things, you are dragging yourself down. Far more dangerous. You're going to die anyway. So we get things wrong. Yeah, We think that the street is dangerous and karma is, or actions are not so dangerous. Actually, it's the other way around. It is our actions that are really important. So every time you're about to speak, every time you're about to think, yeah, you're actually crossing a mega highway with massive trucks coming in all directions. Yeah? Look left, look right for goodness sake. Yeah? Will you do that? <laughs> yeah, so this is what we should be doing. Even when we think, actually, ideally, we should think, okay, should I think this or not think this? Usually it's too late because our thoughts are so fast. But uh, ideally we should do that uh, because that is the importance of sila, of kindness. Uh, we're actually dragging ourselves down. We are kind of corrupting ourselves uh, if we don't take these opportunities. Uh, life is so short. Uh, yeah? Before you know it, it's too late. Uh, um, suddenly impermanence happens and Buddhism doesn't exist anymore. Yeah? Maybe when Bachanda dies tomorrow. Is that possible? It is possible, you see? She tells me saying so, so it's possible. What are you going to do then? Yeah, I often think, what happens if Ajahn Brahm dies? That's what I kind of tend to think. I think, gee, that would be scary. What, what was it? <laughs> yeah, because we, sometimes we don't know that these pillars in the, of the community, when they fall down, it changes so much in the world. Uh, 
Yeah, it really kind of turns things upside down very often. Uh, and that impermanence is actually very scary when you understand it. Uh, and it makes the sense of urgency on the path, uh, makes it so much more uh, tangible. Uh, so uh, that is a way of understanding why right view uh, is much more important in uh, practicing uh, virtue uh, than mindfulness. Uh, and so what that means is that, you know, we should put a lot of effort into contemplating the teachings of the Buddha. What do they actually mean? Read the suttas. What does it mean for me? What does it mean for the sense of urgency in practice? And one very simple way you can get that urgency is precisely by understanding impermanence, the unreliability of the world, how suddenly everything is turned upside down. Everything you thought you could hold on to, yeah, you couldn't hold on to it after all. It wasn't safe. You couldn't take your stand anywhere. Yeah, there's always kind of this earthquake waking to kind of make you fall over any time. And that is the problem with the world. So right view. So then the Buddha says, he says, what does he say? He says, hmm. No, he doesn't say that. So that was that was that was me saying that. <laughs> I lose my track here because the page jumps back and forth. Okay, here we are. So, uh, yeah, so all of these ideas about it being impeccable and broken, all that, being liberating, uh, buddhisa, is one of the ideas of uh, virtue. It libera it's liberating in the sense that it takes you eventually all the way to the end of the path. So that's, that sense is liberating. Yeah. But just the feeling of being virtuous uh, is a liberating feeling. Yeah. yeah, because all the defilements that they have the mind, all the feeling if you the way you feel if you do bad things you have remorse remorse is a prison there yeah you can't get out of it you can't just dispel it like that you can help a little bit by forgiving yourself and all of that but you can't dispel it completely so it's a prison that you have made for yourself by acting immorally here yeah so immoral immorality leads to all these negative consequences in the mind and those consequences are basically prisons take those away the mind brightens up the mind feels kind of pure and beautiful. Huh? And that purity within, that beauty within, huh? is actually a liberating kind of feeling. Huh? You're free from all those countervailing or opposite characteristics that actually are very painful and problematic. Huh? So just being kind liberates you, let alone also, of course, liberating other people because you're kind to them, but also liberates you within. Huh? One of the kind of very simple uh, definitions of what is a spiritual action or act compared to a non-spiritual act, uh, if it's good for you and for others, uh, then it's spiritual. Huh? Yeah, Generosity is good for you and also for others. Uh, kindness is good for you and for others. Uh, meditation is good for you and also for others. Uh, meditation is not a selfish thing. Sometimes people say that meditation is selfish. It's nuts to say that. They have no idea what's going on in meditation if they think that. Uh, you become a better person by meditating. Uh, yeah, you are become more of a benefit for the world. So all of these things are spiritual things because they benefit ourselves and other people. And so it's liberating. And um, it is praised by sensible people. If you are kind, if you are a good person, the Buddha would praise you for doing that. Yeah, that's kind of nice to know, isn't it? The Buddha says, good on you. That's an Australian expression, good on you. Good on you, mate. <laughs> That's Australia. So, uh, yeah, so uh, the um, praised by sensible people. Uh, and too often in the world, we are too concerned about what other people think about us. Uh, yeah, do they praise us? Do they say bad things about us? Uh, but other people don't know anything. Uh, they are blind. Uh, they are ignorant. Uh, if they praise us for some superficial thing, what, what does it matter anyway? It's kind of irrelevant. Uh, if they blame us for something that is not worthy of blame, who cares? Uh, and that way of thinking is a beautiful way. I was talking yesterday about overcoming the, crit the self-critical mind. Yeah? And so often that self-critical mind is, uh, comes about by previous you know, criticism for people outside. And then we kind of internalize that and then we become critical of ourselves. Uh, but once you start to understand that people in the world, they don't know anything. Uh, yeah? They don't know what is worthy of praise, what is worthy of blame. The Buddha knows what is worthy of praise and blame. So if the Buddha would praise you, then that is all that really matters. Everything else is kind of irrelevant. So there's also another liberating kind of 
uh, feeling, yeah, or, or way of thinking about things. Uh, not mistaken literally means not grasped. The idea there is just not to hold on too much to the sila. So you hold on enough to make sure you have a sila, but you don't grasp it in a in, in a too much of a way. Especially when you become a stream enter, then the, all the grasping is gone because it becomes part of who you are. You become a moral individual when you are a stream enter. That's kind of part of it. And then comes the last one, yeah, leading to immersion, leading to stillness, leading to samadhi. Yeah? That's the last one here. This is what we see throughout the suttas uh, again and again in various places. Uh, sila always leads to samadhi. It leads to mindfulness first, uh, and then via mindfulness it takes you to samadhi as well. Uh. So this is uh, the idea of, uh, first of all, doing, living right, uh, and then using this recollection afterwards yeah, in your meditation. Yeah, understanding, thinking about it in this way. Ah, I'm doing something that's praised by sensible people, by wise people. Vinyu means also wise, uh, sensible and wise, basically here used uh, synonymously. Uh. Isn't that nice to be praised by wise people? Uh? And so you kind of, yeah, wow, this actually feels good. Uh. I'm living well. Uh. I'm keeping the five precepts, actually keeping more than the five precepts, I'm doing all those other things as well. Uh. It means I'm helping people in the world uh, feeling less afraid. We are afraid in the world if other people rip us off or they tell us lies. That's kind of scary. I don't do that to anyone. I give people the freedom from fear, freedom from anxiety, at least those who come in contact with me. We can give physical gifts and we can give psychological gifts. This is like a psychological gift to the world. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing to give to everyone. That's what happens when you keep the five precepts because you don't cheat anyone. You don't do anything bad. And when you think like that, you start to feel, yeah, this is great. Yeah, okay, you're not perfect yet, but at least you're doing a lot already yeah, to support everyone around you and support the world around you. Yeah. And then, as you reflect in this way, yeah, it really starts to become uh, powerful and uh, beautiful. Yeah. So this is the little bit about the idea of uh, the recollection of virtue. Yeah. I'd like to say much more, but uh, I'm not going to say anything more. Huh? That means you have to come back next time. <laughs> this is the way we trick you to come back next time. No, we, uh, we have to do some more meditation. Huh? So this is just a little bit of background for you, so that we can uh, do some more meditation together. And I have asked my two venerables here to uh, help me with the guided meditation, because that means that I can just relax and enjoy a little bit as well. <laughs> and they have very kindly agreed, so I'm really, really appreciative of that. So I'm going to pass the microphone over to Venerable Upeka, so she can do a little bit of guided meditation for us.